Uh, hi, everybody. Welcome to uh, our weekly webinar series, which uh, as of today, we are uh, going with a new name, which is the new normal. Uh, as we look to a future that is starting to become a little bit more defined and even more remote than it already was before. Um, I'm John Conroy. I am uh, Bebop Technologies VP of Communications and Market Development. Uh, joining me today is Simran Butalia, uh, Bebop's VP of Software Development. And our special guest today is DJ Matias, who's a creative specialist for Foundry. And he's going to be showing off Nuke 12.1, which is Foundry's uh, fantastic digital compositing and visual effects application. Um, before we get started on that, just uh, in case you're not too familiar with what Bebop is and, and who we are, um, we are Bebop is uh, the premier solution for moving post production to the cloud and allowing remote workflows for visual effects artists and editors all around the world, uh, which obviously has become even more acutely important uh, over the past several months. Uh, conceptually, the way Bebop works is similar to the way that you would use any remote desktop, uh, but there's a key difference in that Bebop allows you to access extremely high powered GPUs in the cloud that can more than handle the processing heavy applications and uh, the workflows that editors and visual effects artists require. You need a little bit more uh, horsepower to, uh, to make a cut to a feature film than you do to pull a picture, a vacation picture off of, uh, off of your hard drive. Um, Bebop is able to do this on just a modest internet connection, uh, more than enough than all of us have in our homes. Uh, and uh, this includes expandable high speed, uh, sorry, expandable shared high speed storage. Uh, and Bebop uh, is able to support your existing account uh, with any of the major public uh, CSPs, Microsoft Azure, AWS, Google Cloud Platform, or you can have an account that's completely managed by us. A lot of different ways we can slice it. Um, really, one of the most important factors to keep in mind is that Bebop is the most secure solution that is available in the marketplace. We have a proprietary security stack that's combined with Teradici's PC over IP container. These, uh, that leverages the AES-256 and NSA Suite B ciphers. I always have to check my brain if I'm remembering those uh, terms right. Uh, and those meet the highest level of security that are required by governments around the world. Uh, and so we're actually streaming an image of the desktop, which means that the files that uh, visual effects artists and editors and uh, anybody else who is touching the media, uh, they never leave the security of their private network and get bounced around. Um, but probably I, I think the thing that has always been the best about Bebop is that it doesn't matter whether you're doing visual effects or editing or titling or design, 3D modeling, animation, compositing, motion graphics, compliance, you can use the same tools, uh, the industry standard tools that you already use every day and that you've uh, traditionally used on-prem uh, or at your uh, desktop. Uh, any of those tools that you uh, have a license for or uh, a subscription for like your Adobe Creative Cloud or Autodesk software or the reason why we're here today, Foundry software, um, those are the same softwares that you are going to access on the Bebop platform. And, uh, and so to show us uh, the amazing Nuke 12.1, uh, 12 right? Yeah, 12.1. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to DJ uh, to, um, to run the show. Welcome, DJ. Great. Thank you so much, John. And thank you, Bebop, for having us here as well, having Foundry try out uh, our software on your platform here. So this is definitely a current event that, you know, with what's going on, a lot of people are going to want to be able to get in on something like this. I'm sure they're already working from home as it is, um, but this might make it a little bit easier, you know, just to be able to bring your own license, bring your own software, connect to it anywhere you are. But you guys all know how that works anyways. So let me just uh, share my screen here real quick. Uh, I'm close this, I'm trying to find a little share, share button. Always something, no matter how many times I do this. It should pop up if you move your mouse. There, there you go. The, the window is just too small to show my little share screen button. There we go. All right. So hopefully everybody can see that. Yes. 
I did notice a couple familiar names in the chat or the attendees thing there. So hi, Ryan, big shout out to Ryan Kinlan, uh, former CS as well. And then Tom Sinnott, he used to work with you at uh, Legend back in Carlsbad. So thanks for joining us today. Um, let me just go ahead and get started. I don't know how much time we'll have to get through everything, but I'll just show you right now. I'm currently on my virtual computer, basically. And the nice thing about this is I can walk up, sit down to uh, my desk right here and not know whether you know I'm actually connected in the cloud or if this is actual my, my actual physical desktop I'm looking at. So that's, that's something I kind of like there. It's like a seamless kind of integration there. So let's go and see what we have new for you in Nuke if you haven't already noticed. Um, I'll get started on that. So we're talking about Nuke 12.1 today. And here I am, this is actually, I kind of do my demos and stuff out of Nuke Studio. So that way, if you haven't recognized this kind of workspace before, if you're a compositor, if you've used Nuke before, you might not recognize this unless you've news, used Nuke Studio or Hero. I like to do it just to kind of give you some kind of exposure to that. Say, hey, oh, there's another Nuke product that I'm not familiar with, I might want to check out. So here we have Nuke Studio. It gives us the access to a timeline. So when you're working with multiple shots, say if you're a kind of like a comp supervisor, VFX supervisor, whatnot, and you have all these shots in your timeline here, it's gonna allow you to, Nuke Studio will allow you to kind of create your comps directly from the timeline. And it gives you access directly to Nuke X's node graph as well. So you can just jump right into the node graph from the timeline. Very handy, very helpful. I mean, other than just like the slideshow presentation, it's a great tool just for doing reviews, dailies, anything, anything like that as well. All right, so I'm actually just gonna change my workspace, maybe just a little familiar to what you're used to seeing. If I go into compositing, it'd be something like this. There's compositing um, workspace. But because I do have this in Nuke Studio, I'm gonna add my little timeline down here in a custom workspace that I have as well. And we'll just go operate from that way. So now I have access to my timeline and my node graph. All right. So new to Nuke Studio, or sorry, new to Nuke 12.1. We've introduced, uh, kind of revamped the shuffle node, or I can't even say revamped, it's almost like a new shuffle node, because basically what we've done is we've taken uh, the old shuffle node itself and the shuffle copy, and we've combined them into one new node now. So if you're familiar with the old shuffle node, you kind of had to go through a bunch of check boxes and drop down layers or drop down menus, kind of get the output that you were looking for. Um, if you wanted an additional input or bring in some channels as well. You kind of have to shuffle copy those channels in, uh, going from you know, bringing that in here. But now the new shuffle node, as you can see here, is a lot more kind of, I'd say, pretty user friendly. You know, it uh, has a nice little layout here. It has a pretty interactive, uh, where you can just drag your channels around to whatever output you want. You can swap those around like that. You, it has uh, two inputs, and each of these inputs can output uh, eight channels per, per these input layers. So if I were to connect another input here, say this roto node, and I want to bring this information in here, then I'll be able to have that information. So I can say forward. I can even shuffle this forward uh, that I'm using as an alpha out just as easily as that. So I can just take it, swap it over there if I want, or I can have another output if I want to do that as well. However you might want to use that. It's very flexible. You know, it lets you just swap these around. I can connect them all at once if I want a, uh, oops, there we go. If you want a full, just black it out, you can just hit the black button here. If you want a full alpha, just hit the white button for the full alpha there. You can take these panels, swap them up, up and down just like that. You know, if you get a bunch of noodles crossing over each other and it'd be more uh, better like that, you can swap that around. So that's really neat about the shuffle node now. Uh, hopefully a lot more people will be less intimidated by it, by, by you know just the check boxes and now you'll see it more user friendly to be able to shuffle out the channels that you're actually looking for there. All right, so let's move on to our next feature that we have here. Lens distortion workflow improvements. Basically kind of the same um, lens distortion uh, functionality that you're used to, if you've used it before. Uh, what we've done now is just revamped the UI or of the, the node properties themselves. So there's a few different panels. The first panel is your standard kind of basic settings, what you want to go with. Um, and then now also by default, the lens distortion node is set to undistort rather than ST map. So that way you're gonna see your results right away rather than having to go in and actually change it to undistort um, as you would in the older version of the lens distortion node. And then on the analysis tab here, 
this is where you would just kind of do your analyzing of the, 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 the grid, if you have a grid. Let me pull this in here real quick. Connect that. You can just look through there. So hopefully you've shot your footage with some kind of grid and then uh, be able to just use this grid to undistort it. So basically, I'll just leave this default setting in my lens description tab or lens distortion tab. Go to analysis. And what we've also added in here as well is a preview tab. So you can kind of preview the lines that it's going to draw uh, on, the, on the grid before you actually solve it. So if you see stuff that's off, you might be able to know where you're going to fix that. So I'm going to turn off that. Then I want to go ahead and detect my grid. I know that's there. And now we can also manipulate these things to make it, you know, just a little bit uh, cleaner or just kind of a better solve, you know, just by adjusting these things. So when I go to solve for that, pops out my grid for me, undistorts it. And then there we go. So that's before and after. And then I can take this and just apply it to any kind of footage that may have been distorted based off of that. And I'll undistort that. And there we go. We have it. Some nice straight lines. If for any reason you haven't, uh, didn't shoot with or didn't shoot the grid with your lens, you can always just use the lens distortion kind of like user solve. If I look at this and they'll add in a lens distortion node for this. And the user way, you kind of just go about it, drawing lines that you know should be straight in the physical world. So if I have this right here, let me look through that. And then we basically, it's not drawing the line for me there. Can you guys see the line? No, it's not drawing. Let me try that again. Lens distortion. If at any point in time you guys have questions, uh, John, or you need to answer any questions that people have, feel free to jump right in and interrupt me. Uh, and so that way you can answer the questions as well that that anybody might have. Sure thing. Okay. Sure thing. Well, and I know that uh, Sim will, will address how we handle the licensing um, yeah. uh, after we get through the... <clears throat> sure, I just had a brief note on, uh, on performance of these machines. Uh, one of the great things about working in the cloud is uh, we can easily, you know, scale these things up and down. Uh, so if you have a Critical workload that requires a lot of performance. We can give you a machine with more horsepower, multiple GPUs, uh, almost at a click of a button. Um, so you really get to utilize uh, performance uh, and not really have to upgrade anything locally. You, know, you continue to use uh, the same workflow uh, of connecting to a machine in the cloud, uh, but in the background, the heavy lifting is done for you, uh, and uh, and uh, we can uh, we can you know really scale these up to your uh, to to a performance that you would need. In your workflow. Okay. All right. So it's, it's, it looks like it's working now. So basically, yeah, uh, I would take these and um, kind of just draw the line that I know should be straight. I'd want at least four of these. And then once they have four of them available, I'll be able to solve and it's going to do the same thing it would if it had a grid there or pretty close to it. It's going to undistort that for us. All right. So moving on. And this is, I should mention that it is a Nuke X feature, the lens distortion node. Moving on, we have the grid warp, or I should say the grid warp tracker. Um, we introduced the grid warp tracker in Nuke 12.0. Uh, we made some improvements since then. Some of the improvements we've made are, we ha have the ability to actually take some of these tracking points. So if I have a tracker here, I can take these tracking points now and actually export any, any kind of tracking data I may have gathered from it or collected from it. You can go to take it and go uh, export to a tracker that's baked, a tracker that's linked, or a transform that's baked. Now, this one doesn't have any tracking on it, but I do have one that's already tracked to save us some time. So I'm just going to swap this into here. Let's take a look at that one. What's this grid right here? Because basically what we've done for this particular shot, let me put it in the right frame range. 
is we just kind of took this prosthetic eye, it was a little misaligned and we repositioned it back into place. Uh, and that's through our smart vector tools. So the grid warp tracker works with smart vectors. This is also a Nuka-X feature as well. And the great thing about the grid warp tracker is because it's being driven by the smart vector information, uh, let me see if I can get this to play through. What's gonna happen is that as this goes out of frame, this grid, usually if you try to track something out of frame, it'll stay out of there or shoot off somewhere else maybe, but because of the smart vector information that's associated with it, it brings it back into, into frame and it maintains its position for you. So once you have all that gathered, that, that tracking information, you can, take, you can take all the points if you want and export that out as uh, export all the points out. So let's go ahead and export this as a tracker baked maybe. See it pops in right here. So if we look at the information it gives us in that tracker, you can see all of those points from that grid warp tracker. We have all that information there for us. And of course, you know, you can select any, any number of points that you want to do. Uh, close that. So if I were to just like say use the lasso tool and select some random points like that, same idea, be able to expect, export out this information as well. We'll try to transform bake just to show you that one. Oh, oh, blue, blue wheel there, hopefully it recovers, there we go. And take a look at that information and that's all uh, keyed in there as well for you. So we can probably look at our curve editor and see all that information there for us. All right, let's move on. In, Actually, yeah. That, DJ, one of the things that uh, has popped up in the Q&A box was a question from Neil about uh, what type of machine you're using. Oh, okay. Um, Tim, you want to, you know, well, DJ, why don't you tell us what machine you're using at home? Well, I, at home, I'm actually on a Z820 workstation from HP. Um, but I mean, I think at, at, regardless at this point, I'm not actually using any processing power really that much to to run the uh, Bebop uh, client and tap into the workstations on the cloud there. So I think I, I, you know, I could probably run this from a laptop even, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, as long as yeah. I have a pretty good internet connection, uh, we'll be good to go. Cool. Yeah, so for the, uh, connecting to the workstation, all you need is a you know, simple MacBook Pro uh, yeah, and uh, you can connect to a Bebop machine. And when you actually get into the machine that DJ is running in the cloud, uh, that has you know 12 cores and 112 gigs of RAM, uh, and so it's very high powered and a, a, a NVIDIA Tesla M60 GPU attached to it. Uh, so the horsepower one, that one, the one you're connecting to is far superior uh, to what what you need locally. Um, so you can have we have a, we have even a kind of tested this on a Sony Vio 32-bit machine. <laughs> we don't recommend it, but you know you can. Uh, definitely have a very low powered machine uh, locally. And, uh, you know, if you have a zero client, what we, uh, it's even uh, better from a performance standpoint. A, a zero client is a simple box that you can uh, connect your ethernet uh, wire to uh, and have uh, two monitors, two to four monitor attached to. And uh, it has no OS, it's straight from hardware uh, directly into the cloud. So that brings even a better performance and uh, it doesn't require a fan, so it's a lot, lot le less bulky on your desk. Uh, and I'll, I'll be happy to show you a video of that. So from a local perspective, you have multiple options to connect to it. Uh, from a most flexible uh, option is to use your existing laptop. The most optimal uh, option is to use a zero client uh, and, and uh, be able to connect via that as well. Okay. Okay, all right, well, thank you so much for that information. Um, moving on, you may already be familiar that Car VR plugin is has been included since Nuke 12.0. Uh, so if you've ever used Car VR for you know, VR projects or anything like that, and you had the plugin, now most of those tools that were in the Car VR plugin are included in Nuke 12x or Nuke X 12 and 12.1. So I say most of them because what hasn't made it into there is the stereo tool. So if you're doing any stereo VR, you won't be able to find that in the Nuke X uh, car VR version. And on another note, on top of that is if you do have the car VR plugin, um, we stopped supporting that in Nuke 12.1. So 
if you upgrade to new 12.1 expecting your car vr plugin to to work with it that's not gonna it's not gonna work for you that way so the last version that it's gonna work with is is 12.0 so just a little fyi out fyi on that uh, if you do have a, a need for the stereo tools inside of Kapara, then please you know send us a, a request to include those stereo features inside of NukeX now. With that being said, um, with 12.1, we've done a lot of work under the hood for you know processing not only Kara v VR GPU caching, but anything that's like Blink Script uh, that has Blink Script or anything that's GPU enabled. What this means is you're going to see a lot of gains now uh, because the way the, the GPU caching works, it's not going as long as you um, say concatenate all, or concat yeah concatenate the nodes uh, like have all like the GPU nodes and in a line and you don't break that concatenation with something that's not GPU enabled, you're gonna get really good performance out of your script. So unfortunately not every single node inside of Nuke is currently you know, GPU enabled, but there are quite, uh, quite a few. Now, and most of them are, are in the Car VR tool set, as well as some that you might find um, in Nuke and Nuke X as well. So just keep that in mind for optimization of your scripts if you can. Arrange it so that way you keep your nodes to GPU nodes in line with each other so you're not breaking any concatenation. When you do go to you know, either uh, say play it back or render it, you're going to see a little bit better performance out of that. And what we have here in this example is just a script of pretty much the same script. One's concatenating, so it's passing it through all these uh, nodes that had GPU enabled. Um, car VR based and then ones the same nodes are being broken up or breaking the concatenation by throwing a grade node in here so when we came down to rendering it basically for a five frame render just a quick render whatever um, three minutes on this side for the, the GPU caching and then 347 so you can imagine how much bigger script and much more frames how much more time you're actually going to save so this is just this is a pretty good gap right here it's almost it's 39 seconds I guess basically um, so that's pretty good right there. And then put that over many multiple frames, you're gonna add even more time you're gonna be saving to that. We've also uh, updated our bilateral node. So some of these some of these tools we've combined with Kara and some of the ones that already existed in Nuke. The bilateral node as being one of them. Basically it's added the functionality uh, of GPU support for the bilateral node. And then we've added in a median filter for that as well. And if you guys aren't familiar with what the bilateral node does, it's kind of like um, a smoothing filter that's gonna allow you to maintain your edges. So if we look at an example, like say this right here, look at this one. What we're gonna do is we're gonna add a bilateral on here. You see what it did, if you can see that, hopefully you can see it on your screen. It's basically smoothing the interior of this while maintaining the hard edges along uh, the objects. So a good use for this might be say, if we look at this, what I've done is basically kind of divided off the information in there, uh, graded it up a little bit, kind of pull it out a little bit more and then multiply it back over itself. The reason I'm doing this now, if we look at between the two, there's the original. And now I'm able to just enhance this detail of, hope you can see that, of between the original, there we go, this is original. This is enhanced detail, basically using the bilateral node, being able to pull off uh, out some of that detail and grade it up for you. Another use might be, uh, say this one right here. Oh, a little too close on there. So bilateral node, the way it works is it's kind of taken into account the spatial distance and color similar similarity of the pixels around it. And so what we can do for that is if we look just right now, if I throw the bilateral node on here, you'll see it kind of kind of cleans it up a little bit, smooths it out. If we look at it before and after, hopefully you can see that on your screen, the job that it's doing. And basically, this is being driven by a guide. Or um, so without the guide, if we look at that through the bilateral node, we get a little bit of uh, artifacting. And basically, by adding the guide, which is basically a, a depth map, it's telling uh, the bilateral node where these pixels are at in space. So that way it gives a little bit better uh, spatial estimation or guessing because you're providing that depth information to it. So you're getting better results out of it that way. So if you've never used it before, maybe give it a shot, take a look at it. Um, like I said, this one is GPU accelerated now and we do have added the median filter in there as well. 
medium filter uh, by itself uh, in Nuke is, you know, it's pretty expensive to use in your script. It takes a while to process. So now try maybe with this one and uh, GPU accelerated. Okay. Moving on, we've also kind of combined Kara's spherical transform with Nuke's spherical transform. Um, so that way, just have more ability in one node, basically. So within the new spherical transform, you have rectilinear projection and it's GPU accelerated. Let's open that up. And then you also have access to other filter methods that weren't available as well uh, between one of the either one of the C spherical transform or just the regular spherical transform inside of new. So with that. This is what we get here, looking at that node. And then now we can just change to, to different inputs, outputs, mirror ball, if we want to do that. There should actually be some presets up here as well. No, there's no presets on that one. All right. So a lot of people might think, well, I don't really use car, car VR. I don't really work with car VR at all uh, or any kind of uh, VR projects. And that's fine because the advantage of the VR no car VR nodes is that they're all GPU accelerated. So they do have counterparts you might use in a regular Nuke script like the ST map or the, the blur, uh, C blur. You can use the, the blur, which is a, a C blur, which is a GPU enabled as well. So you might want to just swap those car nodes in and out of the usual places you might use, like say the ST map, the blur, the spherical transform, or whatnot, rather than just thinking, oh, I don't use VR, I'll never use those nodes. You, you might find them more useful than you think. Oh, let's go back to this slide here. So in 12, oops, wrong one. In 12.1, we've introduced the uh, particle blink script node. So basically this allows users to kind of write blink scripts, which are gonna operate on the particles, and then you can write your own particle nodes. Um, let's go ahead and open that one up. I'm not really gonna walk through writing a node because that's kind of foreign to me as well, but I'll show you what that looks like. Got a lot of neat stuff that came in with this build too in regards to the particle blink script. So this would be the particle blink script node. In here, you would basically write your code that you want to put in there. You can you know, pull out any kind of knobs or whatnot. And then you have your knobs that are going to be able to apply to your particles. So if we look at this one right here, let me set this up. All right, and we'll be through this particle emitter. So right now it's currently just shooting straight out from a card. Now by adding the particle blink script node, what we've programmed it to do is kind of just go around the sphere that we have here and we can adjust it by any of these properties that we've added in through the code here as well. So it's gonna allow you to do a lot of neat stuff. Uh, if you don't have any idea like myself on how to write, part or write blink script, we have included a lot of these or like I think 14 of them or so uh, into the package itself that you can use. So if we look at these gizmos down here, all these are new, new particle uh, nodes. So if we look at some of these right here, I'll show you some of these. They're actually pretty fun to play with because they do react so quickly. You know, I didn't really cache these beforehand or anything, but they are very responsive now. Uh, move a lot quicker, not having to wait for these simulations to process like you used to in the past. So let's see, we got constrained to, constrained to sphere here. This one you just saw. Uh, cylinder flow, flows around an object that you, pr you put into it. Um, I think it actually, you define the object here. Yeah, you can do that. Cylinder, oh, it's a cylinder flow. There you go. Uh, another neat one here, let's see, is flock. I like this flock one. Let's close this out. It's kind of like a flock of birds. You can define the path. The uh, density of the flock itself. You can even put geometry into that flock. So if I wanted to throw like actual birds in there, I can connect it to you know my image or my particle, make that particle uh, and a bird, throw bird geometry on there and it'll look like birds for us. Another one is fuse. Fuse is basically what this is doing is as these particles collide with each other, they're basically getting bigger and bigger uh, as they collide. So it builds that up. Um, let's see a bunch of other ones here. We saw the helix flow project. Uh, we can try the displacement one. The displacement one usually likes to process. This one isn't as quick as the other one because we are working with displacement at this point. 
So we'll see how this one works. Basically, this is displacement is being fed by a noise map in this example. But uh, that's kind of what we're getting out of that noise. So I would just look at the noise. That's all it's doing. And this one's pretty neat, shockwave. Take a look at this. Let me zoom out a little bit more. So you can see what's going on there. See a little shockwave effect. And then the speed limit as well. So this one's just, I think I added on a little bit extra glow here to make it a little bit fancier. Let's see if that'll play through for us. It's gonna think about it. Oh, there we go. However you might wanna use these particles. They're a lot of fun to play with now because they are so responsive. So I encourage you to check those out if you have access to uh, NuGex. There's a, if I could jump in for a sec. Sure, yep. Um, I think that this might actually be a really good time to do uh, a quick fun over the shoulder session with Sim. Um, sure. Yeah, uh, absolutely. So if you uh, go to your uh, session dashboard on Bebop, David. All right, let me find my session dashboard. I think I have to get out of full screen here. Oh, oh, it's on my, it's on my Bebop desktop. That's right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right. Um, so one of the uh, really cool things about Bebop and, and uh, how Bebop kind of uh, enhances the experience of being in the cloud is it provides you with collaboration tools kind of built into it in a secure environment, right? Um, so uh, a DJ is working on a machine and you can review and approve uh, this entire session with another producer or editorial team uh, in a secure manner by having them also launch a workstation that's sitting right uh, uh, besides DJ's machine. Uh, and within a click on button, we can review and approve his session. Uh, uh, and so we're gonna try to show that right now. So DJ, if you can send me an invite, just type in uh, Simran Main, M-A-I-N, S-I-M-R-A-N, R-A-N, there you go, perfect. Yeah. Which one? Uh, yeah, the main one. This one, okay. Oh, that's Sorry. not the main. There we go. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and then there just give, it a, give the session a name, just hello, whatever oh. you like. And just send the invite. Uh, and let me share my screen now. So if okay. I don't mind. <clears throat> share screen hopefully everybody can see my screen so here's an example of uh, DJs working on this machine over here and I am sitting on this machine right here I'm going to review his session right so here's an invite that just came in I'm going to join so DJ go ahead and share your screen all right and there we go uh, can you continue working on nuke and let's find out and see and there you go. Now I'm reviewing his session, uh, and I could be sitting in another part of the U.S. or another part of the world in some, some cases and kind of see everything that he's doing. So go ahead and play something or a render. So, so as DJ works on, uh, on his machine, I'm able to quickly review and approve, uh, you know, his session and provide him notes uh, from uh, from another part of the world, or you know, wherever I am on vacation, as producers usually are. <laughs> that, that's usually the that's uh, the big value of Bebop. We are an operating system on top of this remoting remoting protocol. You know, uh, Teradici being one of them. Uh, but really, the the flexibility of Bebop as an operating system and, and providing you collaboration tools on top of all this cool things you can do with Nuke is, is really the value add. Uh, that we provide. So you can upload files uh, to your project, you can download things, uh, set up hot folders, and, and you know, review and approve is just a real quick example of how we securely can uh, do this across the world uh, in, a, in a, you know, content uh, and, and, and piracy is a big issue and, and Bebop really helps kind of solve that in a way. Uh, I wanted to quickly talk through licensing. Uh, with Nuke, you know, we support uh, if you have an external license server simply bring in that IP uh, and open up the connection uh, to, the, to the environment and then we, we can license that uh, uh, your, your external license server right away. So uh, you actually don't need to do anything much. Um, if you have a floating license server, uh, you bring in those connection details and as soon as you launch the workstation, you get licensed uh, right away. 
Uh, we can also host the license server for you. Uh, so if you have, uh, if you want us to host a license server, uh, that's, uh, that's something that our managed services can do as well. Great, so I approve your Nuke uh, environment, DJ. <laughs> Okay, great. Uh, yeah, I was uh, looking in the questions there, um, and they they want to know if you're able to kind of drive from your side, can you know, edit my new move stuff around. Mm -hmm. is, is there an option for that at all from your end? Not right now. Uh, simply because uh, most of our editors and artists request that our producers don't take over the screen. <laughs> so currently, it's a view only. Uh, but you can definitely provide uh, the collaborative feedback back, and if there is a need for it, we can add that to our roadmap for sure. All right, thank you. Um, okay, great. So, yeah, that's very cool stuff that you can, you know, just check out what I'm doing as well, uh, and then we can review together. Definitely makes things easier. Awesome. Yeah. Well, I think um, we're coming up on the end of our, our webinar, so this is going to be going up online uh, as a video on, on demand. You can also find it on the Bebop uh, Technology YouTube channel. Um, and we're going to be having our friends at Foundry back um, as many times as we can to uh, to show off their software and and to talk about the ways that we're working together. And we're really, you know, we're really thrilled to have you on the Bebop platform. And we're especially thrilled that you were able to join us today, DJ. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you very much. I know we got through some of the, the stuff we have here. There's still quite a bit we could talk about and go over if you have me back anytime. So excellent. Well, if, um, if you're listening in and you've got any questions or you want to move forward with, uh, oh, I should put my camera back on. Uh, there we go. Um, if you have any questions or uh, you want to reach out to us, you can reach us at sales at beboptechnology.com. Uh, we're happy to set up a, a private uh, demo for you and, and for your colleagues. We can always bring our friends from Foundry in to um, to show off their software as well. And uh, we're here for you. We're looking forward to the future and uh, welcome to the new normal. So thanks again, I'm John Conroy, uh, Bebop's VP of Communications and Market Development. You've also had Sim Butalia, our VP of Software Engineering and DJ Matias, Foundry's Creative Specialist. Uh, John, real quick, um, and Neil had really some really good questions today. Oh, sure, yeah, go for it. I know you had a few more, but I think, you know, Neil, reach out to us and, uh, and we'll definitely, uh, you know, continue the conversation through email. I just wanted to quickly say that. Alrighty, cool. Thank you so much. And we will see you guys next week. Have a great day.